work of Don Sylvester Waydar, Lee Wang Chia and Ken Cox here to share the same exhibition space for the first time in about 50 years. I wanted to show their shared interest in kinetic art and language and Eastern thought. Kinetic art at its most basic is art that moves. When it is combined with concrete poetry, a poetry where form is of equal or more importance than semantics, it becomes about words that move. Eastern thought, if you try and tease out the commonality in all the various historical Zen and Indian Buddhisms and Taoism, is essentially about movement too and action. That all objects are not things in themselves, but relationships and events. So in the 1960s, there was this moment, particularly in the artwork of these three artists, where there was a real synergy between the two. Don Sylvester, Waydar was an artist, concrete poetry, and first and foremost, a Benedictine monk at Prinish Abbey in Gloucestershire for most of his life. And in the 1960s and early 1970s, the constant clackety-clack of his typewriter keys could be heard through the walls of his small monastic cell. On his Olivetti Letter 22 typewriter, aside from his sermons and theological writings, he produced volumes of letters, scores for sound poems, instructions for happenings, and his typewriter art, known as typestraps. This exhibition, however, uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically does not include any of these typestraps. What I've chosen instead today is, is to exhibit a selection of works from Don Sylvester's Book of Onomasticons, and these are actually the frame pieces along the back here. This is a manuscript for a book that was deposited at South Street Press in 1969, shortly before the money for that press ran out. So in actual fact, to date they've never been published and have spent almost the last 50 years just in a private archive. So it's the first time these have been actually seen for 50 years. But why I so wanted them in this exhibition space really was to create context for this piece which will be performed at the end. To explain these onomasticons, which I think if any piece of work in the exhibition, they're slightly perhaps the most complicated to understand. I want to talk very briefly, I hope that's okay, about a work that's actually not in the exhibition, and a work of art that vanished a long time ago, and we only know about it from surviving photographs and documents. If it still existed, if I could have found it, it would be here, and it would be probably the best example of one of Don Sylvester's poetry machines. In 1970, he had a show at the V&A Museum that included three specially adapted fruit machines. On two of these fruit machines, each revolving disc had, instead of a fruit, a syllable made of two letters. Sorry, on two of these fruit machines, there was a revolving disc and each one had a couple of letters rather than a fruit. And when the lever was pulled, the discs were spent spinning round and they would finally settle on a new three-syllable word. There's actually a sound recording of this, which I am not going to play today, it's too complicated. Um, but then on the third machine, each revolving disc had a monosyllabic word, like moon or sea or sky. And when the lever was pulled down, the discs had finished spinning, a new jackpot three-word haiku would be formed. Now, Dolan Sylvester called these the Raymond Lull memory machine. And he talked about them as follows. I'm just going to read this extract, because it will make sense of how to look at the onomasticons. These are Waydard's words. The blessed Ramon Lull fruit machine. Well, this began with some ideas that went with my earliest permutation poems. Among the various ways for mechanising them <coughs> that I suggested to Ken Cox, the simplest was a series of concentric discs with words showing in the slot aperture. It could have either been plugged in or operated manually. And then I discovered that the blessed Ramon Lull had devised a number of similar machines. <coughs> this is in the 13th century. When the Victorian Albert, <coughs> machine, sorry, Victorian Albert managed to get hold of a fruit machine for me to adapt, it was inevitable I should dedicate it to the blessed Ramon. He was a Catholic, a poet, a Sufi, and the practice of meditating on combinations of letters was before Lull an exclusively Jewish phenomenon and had been developed in the Spanish Kabbalah, which detects in the sacred alphabet the entire universe and all the names for God. Actually, this sort of alphabet meditation that produces a sort of visual poetry is possibly older than the Kabbalah since it forms part of the normal tantric practice in both Buddhist and Hindu, as well as being used outside the Tantra in Tibet and India. So if you look in case two, 
Um, sorry, yeah, let me work out. Yeah, case one over there. So you actually have a letter. So some of these I, um, ideas for these early permutation poems in a wonderful letter that was written to Ken Cox by Don Sylvester. So keeping this in mind with the viewer or the reader or the audience as the creator of the poem, and even as the creator of the actual words, we can turn to this series of work on the wall. Onomastics is the study of names, and onomasticon is a list of names. These onomasticons are visual poems constructed and dedicated to a personal friend. So if you look on the wall, there are people like Apollinaire, and Don Sylvester did know Apollinaire, um, and Ian Hamilton Finley, and lots of other quite well-known artists and poets. These geometric forms are made up of all the letters in that person's name. Dom Sylvester made 21 of these, but we've just included 10 here today. And in fact, many of those actually run to several pages. So again, these are alphabet meditations, in that the constituent parts, the consonants and the vowels in each individual's name are made into grids. Dom Sylvester titled them yantras, as in the tantric Buddhist yantra and they aim visually to condense all the power and energy of an individual's personhood into one symbol. Also like yantras, they're not just visual poems. Donald Sylvester called them polyphonic portraits or mantra portraits or mantra yantra. So they're also scores for a sound poem. For the geometric letter pattern, they are his accompanying instructions as to how they can be read or performed by many voices or turned into a game. So really, they are scores for performance. So actually, I thought I might be able to move closer to them, but you're actually all sat down. So if you actually look at them, for example, there's one of the pieces which is called Iconophonic Portrait for SPJ. And we can see here he has a command that says, any number of voices may read simultaneously in any direction. And then he gives a list of other instructions. And the last one dramatically crescendos to in a fine drizzle of small frogs, orientate the top sheet to the east and read off in order indicated by the frog hop stops. We're not going to attempt that one today, anything. So in many ways, these onomasticons are like the alphabet meditations Don Sylvester talks about when he's describing his Raymond Will fruit machines. Different combinations of letters can be grouped together to form a new word or sound. There are about 8,000 variations possible on the fruit machine, but on these letter grids, there are possibly many, many more variations possible. So how do these poems make sense with the title of the show? How do they perform no things? So not only can a language be a game played by individuals with agreed rules, but we can also consider our name as a conceptual game. It is according to the Mahayana Buddhist teachings that Dom Sylvester studied the sound we impute on an ever-changing collection of body parts and a changing mind. We have growing, then shrinking limbs, a straightening, then a crooked back, renewing cells that eventually one day stop renewing, and permanent memories, thoughts and feelings. Our name, therefore, is the score for a sound piece that we are presented with at birth. How it is then performed in a myriad of ways over our lifetime may or may not constitute the total phonic event. It is whispered to us tenderly by loved ones, given phonemical force through anger or rage, whined, mumbled, clearly enunciated. It is called to us over the open expanse of a beach or in stifled offices, schoolrooms, hospital wards. Our name becomes a mantra, a sacred seed symbol that both we and others impute on our form. On each occasion, the performance is different. The performer too has changed. Yet it is unlikely that in a lifetime the saying of our name can eventually exhaust all possibilities. We are never the same, and our permanent, inherently existent thingness can never be found. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the second artist, Lee Won Chia. And we have various cases with work that shows the friendship and the correspondence between Lee Won Chia and Dom Sylvester. Also in the corner there, hanging two cosmic multiples by Lee Wan Chia. <coughs> so it seems almost certain that Dom Sylvester first heard of the Chinese artist Lee Wan Chia from his inclusion in the exhibition Soundings 2 at the Signals Gallery in 1965. A year or so later, when Lee had moved to London permanently, they met again at the Listen Gallery and became friends. Lee had developed his concept of the cosmic point 
a small calligraphic mark that he made with his paintbrush to mark a precise moment in space and time. This cosmic point, initially made in ink and paint, began to take the shape of reliefs. And as you can see, if you look at the pages of the white book that we've got exhibited there, um, there is a series of shapes, circles, triangles, and rectangles that are just white reliefs on white paper. It's incredibly beautiful. And then coinciding with his arrival in London, an increasing interest in kinetic art and installation art, this cosmic point lifts off the page completely to become a magnetic and movable object, as you can see on the, two, the disc spinning there and the one on the wall. There's a series of cosmic points on there. All these points are magnetic and could, if modern conservation allowed it, be moved anywhere between these two surfaces. In Lee's early shows at the Listen Gallery, many of these discs would have been suspended around the room. In fact, if you look, go to the tank now, they have three, I think, in their small show. And the audience would be invited to move them. Again, the spectator becomes the co-creator. It's very <coughs> playful. Again, Lee liked to refer, again almost, Lee liked to refer to his work as toy art, simple, unpretentious, to be played with, but it could also be meditative. So I want to read out a quote I selected from the White Book that I think is equally applicable to thinking about these cosmetic magnetic points. These engravings in their refined calli sorry, calligraphy that goes back to an ancient origin <coughs> presuppose a profound exploration of the colour white and the limits of space granted that they are bound to a spiritual discipline. Apparently inconceivable in our mechanised age, these signs, based on almost invisible points, inspire us to meditate on the infinite and the finite. Perhaps they will lead us to the ideal land where useless gesture and noises perish, where life and death seem like identical symbols, where perhaps you can see the big in everything which is small. Many of Lee's points were covered with extracts from one of his poems to make a poem point, or a, select, or a section from one of his photographs to make a photographic point. And even in some of the early shows, some of the magnetic points were just oranges stuck with drawing pins stuck in them. So they could be even oranges could be stuck on the work. So it was very playful and very interactive, which is almost difficult to see from modern curation restrictions, how playful that piece would be, I think. So for Lee, it was about capturing a precise moment of perception, the now and the now and the now again as he walked over the crowded and grey streets of London. And the images he chose to photograph or write about are haiku-like, a solitary flower, a man pushing a dust cart, water gushing from a fountain, again the finding of the universal in the everyday and the ordinary. Firstly, then the spectator or the audience is placed at the centre of creation, each action creating the world anew, again and again and again, in a series of monuments and moments, all dependently related and continuous. So if the relationship between the individual and the cityscape was so central initially to Lee's early cosmagnetic sculptures, then the relationship between the individual and the landscape was of primary concern to Ken Cox. Ken Cox met Don Sylvester in 1963, where alongside John Furnival and Tom Edmonds, they formed Gloop, the Gloucestershire group of concrete and kinetic poets. What made Cox's work so unique in the context of British concrete poetry was his experimentation with programmed kinetic sculpture and his visions for this sculpture to integrate into the landscape. Like Lee, whom he met in 1966, Cox, initially a landscape painter, was interested in creating installations that place the audience into the centre of the piece. In a rare interview, Cox said, Sometimes I have had the feeling that some of the huge blank walls which glower at us in the cities are screaming out for concrete poems in very big letters and making the most beautiful pattern of light and shade in abstract, car, in abstract, sorry, in abstract terms. If none of these city poems were then made, there was, however, Cox's very successful um, floating 30-foot high sculpture, The Three Graces, which floated on a raft out at sea for the first Brighton Arts Festival in 1967. The tower's passion, love and beauty, composed of columns of red letters, vertically um, written up, appeared from the distance to be dancing above the waves, until they were destroyed in a storm after 10 days. 
So it is within the context of this scale and ambition for his work that I want to just now focus on the balloons. I'm delighted I've had this opportunity to show these kinetic sculptures because they've not really been exhibited more than a handful of times since 1968. Described as five elemental balloon poems, these bright coloured ripstop nylon balloons slowly and continually inflate with warm air, as you'll see in a little while, rotating around and around in perpetual motion. The white balloon is named Bright Envelope, has the words Bright Envelope screen, paper, screen printed on it for air. The red one, fire. The green balloon is ocean, again has the words ocean on it. The blue balloon, heaven, and the orange balloon is earth. Cox himself elaborated on the choice of colours. These different colours are based on the Chinese concept of the four elements plus heaven. In one of the canons of symbolism, there are five colours, red for fire, yellow for earth, green for ocean, blue for heaven and white for air. So I'm having five balloons in these colours and they will be little poems, elemental arrangements of words, suggestive of the five elements silk screened onto these and they should be seen as a group. They also should be seen as a group to perform their own nothingness too, as the arrangement of these elements within Chinese cosmology demonstrates the interdependence of all phenomena on each other. All things are dependent on each other to come into existence. And although, of course, this is a complete sculpture, I want to draw attention to the letter in case one that Cox wrote to Nicholas Logsdale at the Listen Gallery. Cox wrote, imagine 300 balloons, or 3,000 for that matter, Hell, they're cheap enough, and I expect we could do a, sm a small reduction for quantity. Set out in a large courtyard, perhaps, or maybe a chateau. A big space roofed by a dome with a gallery, high up St Paul's, the roundhouse. The balloons are different colours. They're programmed, a kind of kinetic painting, ambient sculpture. From above, a painting, from below. Walking about in it, a sculptural environmental maze. Waves of colour would sweep across the fields, flow, spiral, burst, chase, anything. Henri Chopin could do the sound. Henri Chopin, for those of you who don't know, is a, a concrete, very experimental concrete sound poet. So again, I think this is a wonderful example of how Cox's work is as much about the relationship of the human to the landscape as any of the finest pastoral poets and painters. So this finally brings me, this short talk I'm afraid, to the Sun Cheese Reload here in a moment. When Cox was tragically killed in the autumn of 1968, Don Sylvester was in the midst of the very prolific phase of constructing the Onomasticon series. When it came to create a poem that would serve as a memorial to his friend, Don Sylvester initially composed what he called an epitaphion, a haiku on the death of Ken Cox, a phonemical play on the Greek word epitaphion, the funeral oration. On the surviving transcript for this epitaphion, Dom Sylvester types out all 26 letters of the alphabet along the top before putting a line through each of the six letters in the name Ken Cox. With the remaining 20 letters, he composes the following haiku. Zahi Munhuta Siri Badu Mujiba Ya Bufipi Gu. Each of the 17 remaining consonants is teamed up with one of the remaining three vowels to create a 17 syllable poem in the style of a traditional haiku. Don Sylvester doesn't state which language, if any, this haiku was written in, but the phonetic sounds hover around Japanese. Of particular interest is the inclusion of the syllable wu or mu. This approximately translates into English as no, not, nothing, nothingness, um, non-existence, non-being. Therefore, the haiku points to the central absence that is at its heart, the absence of Ken Cox. This idea was then developed further in the subsequent non onomasticon that again, like the epitaphion, uses only the letters not in the name of Ken Cox. In this onomasticon, entitled The Sun Cheese Wheel Ode, a double rolling blossom memorial for Ken Cox, the consonants are divided from the vowels. So here we have a screen print that South Street did in 1968. What we can't see is that there are some instructions on the back how to read it, in just the same way as all those onomasticons on that back wall have instructions about how to read it. So a minimum of three voices is required to create a continuous mimetic rolling movement through the letters that's only made evident when the instruction is followed. The trajectory through the consonants is one that spirals inwards to the centre and then out again, so you can see the 
that would be D, F, G, H, J, L, and then eventually start to come back out again and go through them all. So there's a very profound movement that one I see in acting the journey to the centre of being at the heart of so many of the contemplative traditions of the East and the West. It is relevant to consider here because it is a journey made in prayer or meditation or in the recitation of a mantra to the contemplation of yantra that reveals only an absence of an inherently existent self at the centre. This absence, of course, is manifest at the time of death. As Weidad states, these anti-icons, using the letters not in the name, are still total alphabets. In a vocal performance of the sun cheese we load, all the letters not in Ken Cox's name are pronounced one by one, but it is the silence of the unspoken name, Ken Cox, that is in actuality the sound piece. So with that in mind, we're going to perform, I say perform, we're going to recite, perform sounds. Like, maybe a bit. And I think it is made, obviously, in this context, incredibly special by having Ken Cox's daughter Margot Reed and his grandson Lawrence and the artist Lawrence Bradley. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.